Everybody, welcome back to theCUBE's Media Week here, our CXO series. I'm Dave Vellante, the NYSE Wired plus theCUBE. I'm here with Bobby Patrick, who's the CMO of UiPath. Bobby, great to see you face to face. I, mean, I, it's I love awesome. it. And, and, and we're not in Las Vegas. And, 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 <laughs> I love the NYSE. You know, it was just uh, April of 21 that we had our IPO here. Uh, we were the first ones to have our masks off on the bell ring. Oh, really? At the time. Um, so yes, it's quite the great place. What a moment. Now, why did you decide to do NYSE? You know, we, we had like three years of courting by both NASDAQ and NYSE. Yeah. And I just liked the experience. Uh, we brought our founder here one time. I probably came here six, seven times. And he was like, this is my place. And so the experience was great. But actually, they, they did a, a really good job in terms of, the, of, their, of their offer to us. And I, I'm sure those terms are confidential. But, uh, but it was really good for us. And uh, then we can use the facilities here for customer advisory boards and, and our, you know, our headquarters is just right down the street too. So it works out really yeah, well. Yeah, I, I asked Frank Slootman that same question one time. He said, that's where all my customers are. Yeah. <laughs> so right. I imagine you guys, I don't know how many customers you're up to now, but it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, so, a little over 10,000. 10,000, so, yeah. yeah. So we're getting stoked for uh, the uh, Forward Conference coming out October 21st. Uh, I think the Cube has been at every forward except perhaps the first one. Yeah. The first one we were at was at the Fontainebleau in Miami. Right, that was Ford 2, and, which, um, was, yeah. which was awesome event. I it remember how great awesome. that was. Uh, Ford 1 actually was here in the financial district of New York, right down at the Marriott, and the fire uh, chief showed up because we were <laughs> over capacity, and we had to like hold them off. And uh, yeah, so we knew we were onto something big at, when, when that when that Fire Marshal full, I love yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. that was fun. So. UiPath is such an interesting story. You know, you guys were became, you, you, you really disrupted the RPA market um, with a really simple low code model, kind of self-serve yeah, and right. to totally changed the dynamic. Uh, and then I think you were really early on, you know, realized there was there's much more to this thing than just a bunch of bots. Right. Um, that you made some acquisitions, extended, you know, well into enterprise automation. Right. So made some real great moves there, you know, uh, you know process-wise and you know other, you know AI tuck-ins, and then Gen AI comes about. Right. And Daniel Denays, who's the CEO of uh, of UiPath, has always said, "This is an opportunity for us." He's been very clear on that, and he's a real visionary. And I think at first people were like, "Oh no, I can just do this with AI." Right. And I think they're realizing, "Oh wow, I actually don't have the connections, I don't have the integration, I don't have the underlying." Plumbing. So where are we at now in that yeah. whole progression of UiPath? I think you know we've always been an AI company at heart because we've always sought to emulate human workers at a more intellectual level. Right. right? So back in 2017, 2018, as you mentioned with RPA, it was real innovation to figure out how to look at say a Citrix terminal screen like a human does because it's not the same as like a browser where you have selectors and you know you have to actually understand the screen like a, like like a human. So computer vision innovation, then the ability to look at documents, look at handwriting, all those innovations kind of were part of that RPA journey where we got, you know, I think more, uh, you know, more skills that a human workers uh, could have. And what was amazing also, if you think about it, and I never would have guessed this in 2017, is you look at the outcomes, that the productivity outcomes that we achieved during that kind of chapter one RPA era, era. you know, Cigna, you know, closing in on a billion dollars of savings. Now this is all productivity. It's sort of, a lot of that was back office. We're we're now kind of entering a, a probably chapter two. It's why this forward, Dave, is is probably as big of a deal as that forward Montaigne and Fontainebleau, um, in the, in that the pivot, the shift that we're taking. There's a real order of magnitude kind of opportunity for us that we can talk about that I think makes this forward a um, a much different, uh, more consequential forward for us. Um, maybe a, a a big catalyst for growth. We. You know, with with the um, some of the things we're going to announce, we can discuss this. But you know, the, the shift to agentic AI, the ability for us to introduce the ability to create agents and manage agents, and these agents are going to increase the surface area of automation potential in all of our customers, because there's always been a long tail of tasks that robots can't do because they require some level of of, of uh, decision making or uh, autonomous kind of capability or. You know, and, and so now we can go back to all those workflows and we can say, hey, now you can apply agents. Agents work, you know, alongside robots. Agents use robots. Agents can create robots. 
And so we see a real opportunity here to do some big things with our customers. So in addition to the process mining capabilities that you have, <clears throat> I go back to the early days. I remember Daniel telling me that, and you as well, that computer vision was one of the unique attributes that you had uh, that differentiated you. And, and the reason why I bring that up is in the context of agents. So, so much of what we do today cannot be coded, right. whether it's in bots or microservices, it just right. can't be. It's tribal right. knowledge, right. it requires intuition. But our belief is that over time, swarms of agents are going to be able to observe that human behavior, that's and right. a lot of that's going to be on screens. That's right. Uh, and, and it will be able to you know, pick up on that tribal knowledge and learn through an iterative process, and then ultimately be able to execute bottoms up workflows right. uh, based on top down goals in the organization. And that's kind of the vision for Agentic. Yeah, I think, I think what's interesting is that you know, humans are going to interact with agents. Agents are going to interact with robots. Robots, think of robots as sort of the tools. They're the deterministic, rules based, you know, precision controlled kind of executions, right? And the agents obviously are LLM based and they have the ability to you know, create messages, understand. And, 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 and so the way we see it is, is the humans are going to interact with the agents. Agents are going to have many robots working for them, going and harvesting information, you know, making that agent smaller, providing some context grounding to it so that it's, it's you know, maybe not, uh, that doesn't hallucinate as much, that it's more accurate around, around whatever the, the purpose is. So humans interact with agents, agents interact with robots, robots interact with the UI automation of screen or APIs and things. And that's the flow of how it's going to work in an agentic workflow. And, you know, our belief, and you'll see this at Forward, and I bet by the end of Forward, you will believe the same. You cannot have, you know, you cannot be in the business of creating agentic workflows at scale without RPA. So, you know, Benioff can announce agents that sit, you know, next to your CRM and, you know, try to fix some of the CRM spaghetti. Great. But if you want to actually create agentic workflows and manage those at scale, you need one, you need the ability to have agents, robots, humans, and models all working together. And you need the orchestration on top of that. So we are launching the ability to create agents in studio the Agent Studio Builder. We're launching uh, Agentic Orchestration. Again, you'll be able to manage multiple workflows with multiple agents, robots, humans, and models. And within that, you'll be able to constrain the models. You'll be able to select the models. You'll be able to say, to provide context grounding to the models. Really, Dave, nobody does, has this capability. And you can't do it without RPA. You're going to hear Daniel on, on the Cube, and also during his keynote, kind of outline why this is required. So a lot of these guys, you know, ServiceNow and others who don't really have an RPA capability, you know, don't have the ability, to, at least not today, to create a genetic workflows at scale. So the, the, the RPA then becomes the underlying you know, substrate, if you will, sometimes I call it the plumbing, and then the, the high value real estate that's new right. is this agent control framework. That's correct. So that is, something that's going to really propel us to the future. And I want to dig into that a little bit because what we're envisioning is you've got top-down goals of an organization, whatever they are, and you've got right. metrics that you're managing to. Right. Hey, we want to gain market share right. or, or we want to increase profitability. And there's completely different strategies that you're going to take doing that. And humans know what that right. means. Um, but you also have to have connections to the back-end yeah. systems, the yeah. analytic systems, the, right. the, the operational systems. And so those in concert can build bottom up workflows right. that uh, that only humans could really understand before, but over time agents are going to be able to essentially grok what humans are doing. And that's going to drive whole new levels of productivity. Well, and I think, interesting enough, you'll hear this theme, it's, I think this is going to be beyond productivity. So I think RPA was all about productivity. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we hear with our customers around, around kind of agentic automation is that they, believe this is more front office, this is more customer impacting, this is more interacting with externalities outside of their enterprise, customers, suppliers, you know, what, what, and where, where some level of, you know, message, you know, uh, summary uh, creation or interpretation or, um, you know, creative tasks or decision tasks are needed, right? And that is going to be about, you know, increasing revenue, increasing customer satisfaction. You know, I look at like Mayo Clinic, which has been a long time big customer of ours. They've done a lot on the back office to be more efficient. But what they're excited about is, you know, uh, you know, reducing uh, patient mortality, right? And that's what this can do, right? So the, I think that I think the outcome conversation changes considerably with the introduction of, of agents. Oh, well, that's interesting. And AI, AI generally solving right. some of these big problems because, yeah, uh, saving lives is not productivity. 
Uh, although I guess the, the the cost of saving lives could be, pro I look at productivity as revenue per employee. Yeah, and to, right. to your point, I mean, when you right. look at a company like Uber, I think Uber's got like $2 million per employee. Like most right. software companies are a couple hundred thousand per employee. It's already right. in order of magnitude. So to the extent that you're driving you know, new revenue, that's going to be an economic boom, which is going to be important because we got all this debt yeah. <laughs> that we have to, have to deal with. Yeah. So, okay. so. You, you said something earlier that was interesting. It's our only way out, probably, of this debt. Uh, I mean, the reality is we can't raise taxes as much because it'll slow the economy down. We can't. Right. This is the way we get out of it is through productivity. You know, and, and yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, taxing 100 billionaires is not going to get us no. out of this. And, no. and, and otherwise, you're going to be crushing the middle class with the taxes. So, to the extent that you can have this new AI boom, you know. Right. <laughs> Hey, we had it with the internet. And the internet and the PCs drove massive right. productivity booms That's at right. the macro. That's right. <clears throat> um, you, mess, you said something earlier that you guys have always been an AI company. Yeah. Um, so when you saw the AI heard around the world with Gen AI, um, how did you then sort of take the existing expertise that you had in AI and extend that? Can you kind of explain that journey? Well, so we have, yeah, so we have our own models, right? Uh, DocPath and ComsPath and things that exist within our uh, platform, right? To be able to look at documents, certain kinds of documents, interpret documents to, 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 to to learn alongside a human, to improve accuracies and, 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 and such. Um, but you know, those are not massive LLMs, right? They're, they're, they're small language models in yeah. some ways, right? Um, and so I think, I think you know, but LLM, what, what Gen AI did was it really opened up the mindset, right? Because people could touch it and feel it and say, wow, this is, this is transformational, right? I think you know, many employees and companies use Gen AI today, but do businesses yet, have they, have they figured out how to, to operationalize Gen AI in mission critical business workflows, not yet, right? So I think that's what what our our you know our real opportunity is. So uh, another big thing I think I, I mentioned earlier. So the future is really about you know agents, robots, humans, and models. You know on the model front, we'll also announce uh, BYOA. You know bring your own agent. So huh. um, like we have our own autopilot apps that you know EY has two hundred twenty thousand users that use our autopilot on the desktop to ask questions and use different automations. But if you want to use Microsoft Copilot, you can as well. But in the world of models, what we're going to do and what we're, what, we're, what we're saying is, you know, you can bring your own model, right? So we'll, we have two big announcements at Ford with big um, AI companies. Well, uh -huh. I, I can't tell you yet, but, but, uh, but you know, bring your own model, you know, fit your own model. And our agentic orchestration will actually orchestrate, you know, whether it's our models or it is your models, you know, along with the robots, the age, you know, and, and, and your agent, right? So if your agent is, you know, a Salesforce agent for sitting next to, C, to CRM, Great, you can do that and you can use that. We'll be able to orchestrate that as well. So there's some pretty cool, it, it, this kind of sticks to one of the principles that we had all along, which is we want to be kind of that open, heterogeneous, you know, across platforms. If you remember those slides we used to show, we'd show a slide that had all these different application vendors on it, you know, Salesforce, and then maybe it's Marketo, and then it's, you know, um, uh, Microsoft Excel, and all. The, and so we would talk about how we integrate all of these pieces, right? Whereas most RPA vendors would be like in a stack, like in the SAP stack or in the Salesforce stack. In the world of models, we want to do the exact same thing. Yeah, and I think that's going to be a very unique position as okay. well. Okay, this is a really important point. So a couple of things I want to pick up on what you said. So the 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 S uh, LM small language models we see as really that's where all that dark data exists, right. and you can really take advantage of it. So each company can have its own proprietary advantage, and those. SLMs become SAM, small action models. Right. And so now the agents are going to really, you know, drive that. Now, I, I agree with you. And the I, action models are very key, right, Dave? Because the action models, like large language models, point with probability to the next word. Large action models yes. point with probability to the next action. In next best action. And, and yeah. back to that point you made earlier, we can watch with task mining, you know, uh, we can watch on a desktop what some human users doing, learn from those human users kind of in collection and create that large action model or small action model, right? And with probability determine what that next step's going to be. And again, that's a big part of, of agentic workflows and a big part of our forward event. And that's how you, the original point is that's how you scale right. automation. You cannot scale it without the ability to watch what humans are doing and then apply it across an organization. And then the other thing I want to pick up on, I actually think that you know, Salesforce and Oracle and, you know, work that, they'll all have AI within their own domains. Right. But something that you said is key is it's not going to be horizontal. I'm not right. going to go to Oracle to get, you know, my SAP, right. you know, agentic, right. I'm just not. And I'm not, and vice versa. And I'm not going to go to Salesforce to figure out my, my workday right. activity. No, but I would go 
to a UI path. It's sort of an independent horizontal layer. And that's, that's the big you're opportunity. Especially when selecting your own models. Now, I mean, fast forward from selecting your own applications. So you have uh -huh. all these applications of how you actually do work, including email and PDFs and everything else, right? In the world of models, you're going to be picking models based on context. So you know, agents are going to be also role-based. You know, we'll have BDR agents for business sales reps to have an agent. We'll have claims uh, approval agents. They begin to be wrapped in the context of a small language model or an LLM that understands the context, that has connections into internal systems to ground the context, right? That, all of that, that ability to do that kind of um, across all these roles, again, will be the only open kind of transparent player in doing that at scale. Well, it's critical because if you don't have that capability, that horizontal capability, we all know we've created islands of automation in applications, and we're just going to create islands of automation again yeah, right. with, with, with AI and Agentic. So that horizontal layer, not only is a huge opportunity, it's critical to really realize this vision that we're putting forth. Yeah. What do you want to be able to say a year from now, um, maybe even two years from now that you can't say today? I, I, so I think we had, a, you know, we had a vision, if you remember back to that Ford uh, in Fount Fontainebleau in, in uh, Miami, I think it was that Ford that we unveiled a vision for a robot for every person. Yes, right. We were wrong. It's probably an agent for every person. And I think that's what we'll start to see happen, right? And, and you know, I think back to like, so one of the, one of the on stage, one of our um, presenters is EY. And I, this is public already, so I can kind of say it, but they'll be up there talking about how they have migrated 220,000 employees, right? You know, to, auto, to autopilot for everyone and to, to our assistant. And, you know, call that assistant, call that an agent, you know, whatever, now it's all Gen AI powered now, right? I think it's probably more an agent uh, for every person. Bobby Patrick, thanks so much yeah, Dave. for coming in. See you in a couple weeks. To the studio today, yep. see you in uh, Las Vegas, October 21st. All right, keep it right there. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube plus NYSE Wired Media Week with our CXO series. We'll be right back right after this short break.